Bananas Worldwide, over a hundred billion individual bananas are produced each year in the form of over a thousand varieties. They are clearly one of the world's favorite fruits. But more than that, many millions depend upon bananas for daily survival. But what is the story behind this fruit? Where did bananas come from, who spread them, and how did they take over the world? Ladies and gentlemen, hello and welcome to Fire of Learning's History of Food and Agriculture series. Thank you for joining us in this episode as we tell the story of the banana. Where did the banana come from in the first place? Wild bananas grew throughout a region stretching from India to southern China to northern Australia. The question of how bananas were domesticated, and how those domesticated bananas spread, has itself driven researchers bananas. It's a difficult topic that requires further investigation. To date, the earliest evidence for domestication comes from the Kuk Swamp of modern-day Papua New Guinea, dating back to about 5000 BC. These bananas were not very appetizing. They were dry, full of large, hard seeds, and less fruit. However, eventually, hybridizations between different subspecies and varieties produced seedless bananas, or rather bananas with tiny, infertile seeds that humans could reproduce by replanting what are called suckers. These bananas began to spread, with the best of these hybrids becoming predominant. The spread seems to have primarily occurred on the boats of the Austronesians. The Austronesians are a group of peoples who descend from groups that began migrating out of Taiwan around 3000 BC. Slowly, over thousands of years, they would spread out across maritime Southeast Asia and beyond, colonizing lands from Madagascar to Easter Island, and establishing the first extensive trade networks in the Indian Ocean. They picked up these domesticated bananas early on along their journeys, and gradually introduced them to their trading partners and settlements. These bananas, aboard their ships, boldly went where no banana had gone before. There is evidence that domesticated bananas reached the Middle East by about 1100 BC. If so, they were likely in India before this. They likely reached China around 200 AD, East Africa, where they would also take on great agricultural importance, by 500 AD at the latest, and Hawaii by at least the 1300s AD. There is some evidence to suggest that domesticated bananas may have mysteriously reached places like Africa and India long before these dates, but this is again debated. So far as we know, the first time bananas were mentioned in writing was in the Pali Canon, Buddhist text from India dated to roughly 600 BC. Bananas became considerably important to the peoples of the Indian subcontinent, as they still are. Bananas became a symbol of fertility in India, and were common gifts, often placed on the doorsteps of houses in which weddings were taking place. The plant became associated with Lakshmi, the goddess of wealth, fertility, and prosperity. Fascinatingly, bananas are believed to have even possibly shaped the shapes of several writing systems. The leaves of banana plants were used alongside palm tree leaves to write upon in these regions. The rounded letters found in scripts like Sinhala, Burmese, and the mysterious undeciphered Rongo Rongo script of Easter Island may be a product of the fact that letters with sharp angles would have more greatly risked splitting leaves. Greeks like Theophrastus wrote of bananas, and it's very possible that Alexander the Great encountered them during his campaign to India in 327 BC. The Romans knew of bananas as well. It is said that Antonius Musa, the physician of the Emperor Augustus, included bananas as a dietary remedy for illness. However, bananas were still probably somewhat uncommon exotic fruits to the Greeks and Romans. In fact, it isn't completely certain that the fruit Roman scholars like Pliny the Elder were talking about were bananas. When the Western Roman Empire fell, Europe most certainly became thoroughly bananaless, but they very clearly remained in the Islamic world, which stretched from the borders of India to Iberia. Numerous different works from the 7th century onwards discuss the cultivation and consumption of bananas throughout the Islamic world. Even the Quran, the Islamic holy book, briefly mentions them, stating that bananas will be among the abundance of fruit that the righteous will find in heaven. Later, Christians coming from Europe to the Holy Land from the Crusades onwards encountered bananas in some circumstances. For example, in 1458, the Italian writer and nobleman Gabriele Capitolista wrote of strange fruit he encountered being grown on plantations in the Christian kingdom of Cyprus, which were, quote, very much like small cucumbers, when it is ripe it is yellow and very sweet of savor, end quote. 
Still, knowledge of bananas in Europe was limited. In fact, even though Iberia was a part of the Islamic world for centuries, several examples suggest that by the time the Spanish and Portuguese had finished the Reconquista of the peninsula in the 15th century, they had forgotten about the bananas that once grew there. When Portuguese explorers encountered banana plants in West Africa during this age, they appear to have not recognized the fruit, let alone had a word for it. Rather, they adopted the West African Wolof word for the fruit, which was actually indirectly Arabic, a word meaning fingertip. This word was banan. But after a few decades, the Portuguese and Spanish became more familiar with bananas and took interest in growing them. In 1516, a Catholic missionary named Tomás de Berlanga transported and planted banana stems on the Caribbean island of Hispaniola, an event believed to have marked their first introduction to the Americas. From there, he and others would spread the banana across much of the Americas with such success that it was considered by later botanists that the plant originated in the Americas. The Portuguese began growing bananas in Brazil and West Africa as well. The Spanish called the banana platano because they were reminded of their native plane trees, which gives us the word plantain. In English, plantain refers to the tougher, starchier varieties of the fruit that are typically used in cooking, whereas banana refers to the sweeter varieties eaten raw. However, this distinction mostly only works in Western markets. More complicated classifications are required when including the full variety of bananas in existence, but ultimately, all of them, including plantains, can be referred to as bananas. Banana plants are giant babies. They are easily killed by cold, require a large amount of water and sunlight, and require a year or two to fruit. Furthermore, even the hardy varieties can expire rather quickly once picked, and so transporting them from afar was difficult and often ended in failure. As a result, it would be some time before most Europeans or Northern North Americans became familiar with them, let alone ate them. There was apparently an attempt to grow them in the English colony of Roanoke, according to Virginia Scott Jenkins' book Bananas in American History, but this proved unsuccessful. Because, yeah, all the people there disappeared, but the climate would have prevented it anyway. Banana plants belong to the genus Musa. There are 83 species within the genus, but nearly all bananas that people consume come from different variations of just two species, Musa acuminata and Musa balbiciana, and hybrids of these two species called Musa paradisiaca. Banana plants can reach up to 40 feet in height. With their long, sturdy stalks, they very much resemble trees, but while they are sometimes called trees, they are actually not trees, just tall herbaceous plants. The banana plant is a monocarpic plant, a fancy way of saying they fruit once, then die. Each plant produces roughly 100 to 150 individual bananas. Because these bananas do not produce seeds, humans must cut and replant their suckers. Suckers are offshoots that grow at the base of the plant, which can be cut and replanted to grow a new plant, essentially a clone of the parent. In the late 18th and early 19th centuries, there was increased interest in bananas from Europeans and Americans. The first known shipment of bananas to the United States occurred in 1804, when red bananas were imported from Cuba to New York in one incident and sold as exotic curiosities. Meanwhile, in England, members of the upper classes were cultivating bananas in greenhouses, such as the 6th Duke of Devonshire, William Cavendish, who gave us the Cavendish banana, which becomes quite important later on. Overall though, the banana still remained relatively obscure and expensive in much of Europe and the United States throughout most of the 19th century, barely venturing outside the circles of the wealthy and learned of those countries. In 1872, Jules Verne discussed bananas in his famous book Around the World in 80 Days, drawing curiosity from an audience largely unfamiliar with them. It wasn't until a certain technique to harvest unripened bananas was invented, and, more importantly, the development of refrigeration in the late 19th century, that the transportation of bananas, kept in good quality to cooler climates, became realistic. The modern banana industry was soon thereafter born. The popularity of bananas would skyrocket, and Americans began importing this cheap fruit in large numbers from across Latin America around the year 1900. The United Fruit Company, which formed from the merging of smaller companies in 1899 and is today known as Chiquita, came to dominate the banana industry. 
The banana industry, meanwhile, quickly became a crucial piece of the Central American economy in particular. As a result, the company, along with its two other later competitors, the Standard Fruit Company and Cuyamel Fruit Company, quickly became Central America's largest employers and in some countries, largest landowners. The importance of the banana industry to these countries was such that these companies were able to hold a massive degree of influence over the political and economic affairs of nations like Guatemala and Honduras. They built and controlled much of these countries' transportation infrastructure, heavily influenced their politics and law, and were even involved, on multiple occasions, in overthrowing the governments of these nations to replace them with governments that were friendly to their designs and interests, which caused a great deal of strife and conflict in this region. The histories of the so-called banana republics will likely be discussed more thoroughly in future videos. Originally, the Gros Michel, or Big Mike banana, was the unchallenged main banana cultivar of the international banana trade. However, in the 1950s, large tracts of the crop started being destroyed by disease, a fungal infection called Panama disease. Because banana crops reproduce via what is essentially cloning, they lack the genetic diversity that would typically spare a portion of a population from disease outbreak. By the 1960s, Gros Michel bananas were so devastated that a change became necessary to save the entire industry. The aforementioned Cavendish bananas, which farmers noticed grew in the same soils as Gros Michel but remained unaffected by disease, quickly took their place. Today, nearly all bananas consumed in Western countries are Cavendish bananas. However, regrettably, we cannot yet rest easy. Cavendish bananas are today threatened by a new strain of Panama disease known as TR4, just as the Gros Michel once was, with a solution seeming decreasingly likely. Thus, the day may come, and it may not be very far in the future, in which the Cavendish bananas of today's world will have to be replaced by something new as well. And there we have it. The History of Bananas. B-A-N-A-N-A-S.